So what I've been asked to do is talk with you about how to improve your thinking and memory. So my first question to you is, are you guys noticing any changes in your thinking and memory? Are you noticing that you're a little bit more forgetful, that you're a little bit slower? Problems multitasking? Or thumbing problems? Yeah. Yep, yep, okay. Well, guess what? You are not alone. Because most people starting in their 60s actually show changes in thinking, memory, problem solving. And these are, what I've shown here are two really large studies that were done by Dr. Shea uh, in Seattle. It's a Seattle Longitudinal Study. He studied over 6,000 people as they age from starting in the 20s all the way to their 80s. And what you'll see here is not particularly promising news, but you'll see that people are getting a little bit worse and worse as you age. Guess what's, what's the major difference between young people and old people? Age. Age. <laughs> 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 it turns the thing in your memory. It's actually processing speed. Think about those athletes. They're so fast and so quick. And then as you age, you become slower and slower. This is just a normal part of aging that all of us experience. And Dr. Foote was talking about how there are these brain-related changes. Well, all these changes in thinking and memory really do relate to your brain getting smaller. There are changes all over the place. Okay, So this happens. This is a normal part of aging. And with Parkinson's disease, it might speed up a little bit, but not necessarily. So. Um, are there things that we can do to stay this off? So I'm going to talk about um, a few things that you can do. Now, as a psychologist, there are two major approaches that you can take to sort of warding off um, uh, changes in thinking and memory. And one of them refers to an approach called restoration. So what does that mean to you, restoration? It means restoring, right? So restore to what you once had. Well, we may, may not be able to restore to what you once had, but we might be able to keep it from getting worse. So one approach is what we call restoration, and the second approach is called compensation. So what does compensation mean? An alternate system, like, you know, keeping notes and lists and things like that. So there are two different approaches. And we're going to talk about both of these and what we've learned from science so far. So, so restoration. The first one in, with restoration is that you can actually make new brain cells. Now, when I was, this is called neurogenesis, making new brain cells. Now, when I went to college and graduate school, I was taught in my neuroscience courses that no neurons were ever made again. You had what you had, and you only lost them. We know that isn't true because there are actually some areas in the brain around the lateral ventricles and in the dentate, which is right next to the hippocampus, which is really important for memory. We know that those areas can make new neurons, and that's pretty awesome. And so the question then is, how do you do that? How can you make new neurons? And it's really very simple. It takes a little bit of work, but basically, in a bunch of animal studies and also some human studies, we know that if you participate in novel, new activities, you can actually make new neurons. So not doing, not getting the same rut that you're always doing. I mean, exercise, which is what was just talked about, exercise can help make new neurons. And the other thing is participating in brain training programs. That can help make your new neurons as well. So we call this neurogenesis. Now there's a second way that uh, we can engage in restoration or restoring, and that's to improve the health of your existing neurons. So how can you do that? Well, what that means is you could increase the number of small blood vessels which are feeding parts of your brain and feeding those neurons. We call that angiogenesis. You're creating new blood vessels to supply um, your brain. And that can improve the health of your brain. And how do you do that? Exercise. Exercise. Exercise may be the cure for everything. <laughs> um, 
So this really results in good blood supply and increased oxygen to your brain. So that's the second, second aspect of restoration. And the third as aspect of restoration relates to improving connections between the neural circuits. And the way that one can do that is by learning new things, engaging in novel activities, do some brain training programs if you want. So that's a, and also physical exercise. And there's a lot of science behind this. Okay, so aerobic exercise, it really does improve cognition. Um, and there have been a number of studies which have shown this. And I'm just flashing a, a few up here, just tons and tons of studies which have shown this, that exercise is important. So here's a, a cartoon which says, I jog five miles every day to keep myself mentally and physically fit. A study that we completed recently at the University of Florida was one where we actually had people combine doing exercise as well as cognitive training. So we had people do both. And this was a study that was done uh, locally at the village with one of my colleagues, Michael Marcisca. And the cognitive training program we had people do was one on a computer using something called the Composite Science Program. And what was really amazing, we had people who had never used a computer before who participated in this program. In fact, this is a picture of one of our participants. She's 93 years old and never used a computer. And we were able to train her up. She just did fabulously. Um, and the training took about 40 hours, so it took a lot of homework. But they came in every day. She came in every day as well as everybody else. And then for the aerobic exercise part, we had people either um, do treadmills or, or, or um, bike on recumbent bikes. And again, they exercise three to four times a week for 45 minutes. It's a lot of work, but they did it. And then the other part we some people did was they did we fit extra, extra games. So have you guys know what we fit is? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's something called connect too. And we, we do the same thing. So you're just learning how to, you're, you're doing these uh, exercises in front of a computer. And here's two of our participants there. And again, they did this three or four times a week. So then, the way we had the study set up, we had some people just do brain training. We had some people do brain training plus physical exercise, like walking or biking. And then we had some people do brain training as well as ex um, we fit. Now, what do you think, which groups do you think did best? The one with both. Say it again? The one with both. <clears throat> right, and which one with both? Uh, the brain training and exercise. Actually, it was the we fit and brain training. And if you think about it, it sort of makes sense. With the we fit, you're actually having to learn new road routines. Whereas with the, um, with the walking and the regular exercise, you're just sort of on a treadmill like a rat, just working really hard. So both, both in the combination, both groups got better, but the week did just a little, did a little bit better. So that's an example of, of restoration. Now what about compensation? Well, the compensation, um, here you're trying to compensate for some of the problems that you have, and, one, and basically you're trying to learn strategies to help you do this. You can use various memory tricks, you can try to keep organized, you can make lists. These are probably things all of you all of you do already, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of us do this. I rely on my iPhone a lot. If you took my iPhone away, I might not remember where I am. Um, but anyway, these are different tricks that you can use. Um, what I'm gonna show, talk with you about though, um, these are, you can use visual imagery, you can, um, an example that's shown here, if you want to remember who Rosa Parks is, you can sort of form an image of that. Do you guys know what Rosa Parks is? Okay. You can form an image of her sitting on the park bench, waiting for a bus to come, holding flowers. So that's an example of using visual imagery. Um, or you can develop acronyms. So for the Great Lakes, the acronym is HOME. Home. It's a great way to remember. Um, Remember things, you can chunk information into smaller bits and pieces. You can, there are a number of different techniques that you can use to help, help improve your memory. So here's a cartoon. How, do you, how, did, how did your memory improvement class go last night? I completely forgot about it. Okay, now, what I'm gonna do next 
is turn this over to one of my graduate students, Paul Mangale. And Paul actually has a very special interest in Parkinson's disease because his father had, grandfather had Parkinson's disease. And he's going to talk with you about 10 top tips we think that might be helpful for you in terms of improving your thinking and memory. But one thing to remember in doing this, it's really important to believe, to, to, to try to attempt some of these things. Lots of people say, oh, I'm not going to try. It's going to be too hard. I'm an old dog. I can't do more new tricks. In fact, you can. not um, And secondly, keep an open to mind to some of the things that you're going to suggest. And finally, not everything might work for you, but some things might. So it's just like uh, what was spoken about earlier, and not everything will work for everybody, but certain things might. So let me turn this over to Paul. Paul is here from New York City. Actually, he's very, um, you've lived all over the world. Um, and Paul's, as I mentioned, his grandfather had Parkinson's disease, so he's a really special interest in this. Thank you for that introduction. And yes, my grandfather had Parkinson's disease, and so that is what inspired me to join Dr. Bauer's lab and do some of this neuroscience research. Okay, so we're going to go over 10 practical tips for cognitive health. The first one I'll recommend mirrors Dr. Bauer's slides. Do something new every day. So what does this mean? This means doing something like watching a new television program, or perhaps trying a new recipe. And why is this important? Well, novelty is great for the brain. And novelty is what we feel, the excitement we feel when we get a new present or when we get a surprise. And this sparks exploration and learning. So I encourage you all to try something new every day. The second tip I have is to take a walk in nature. The University of Michigan conducted a study and they showed that nature walks improve memory better than a walk through a cityscape. And why might this be? Well, being in nature helps your mind unwind and also helps alleviate stress. So I would encourage you all, we're all lucky here in Florida that there is so much natural beauty around us, to go outside and take a walk. This study also showed that even just looking at pictures of natural scenes can help your memory. So, I'm going to show you some natural scenes. <laughs> Look at this beautiful, beautiful um, ocean scene. This is Bora Bora. That water looks wonderful. Here's another scene, a mountain scene. It looks very serene and peaceful. And I encourage you all to go out. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now if I speak a little bit louder? Okay. I encourage you all to go out into nature and go for a walk. My third tip is to use post-it notes, just like Dr. Bowers mentioned. This is a compensatory strategy, and it's great for a quick reminder. Even myself in graduate school, I use post-it notes all the time. My desk is covered in them. Uh, it may be a good idea to keep your post-it notes on the fridge because this is a common place that you will always be going to and you will see your reminders if they are on your fridge. My fourth tip, do a crossword puzzle or a brain teaser. Doing a crossword puzzle will challenge your language and memory skills and help you to form new associations. It will help you flex your mental, mu mental muscle and sharpen your mental acuity. Other things that you can do include doing puzzles, maybe playing with a Rubik's Cube, doing Sudoku, any of these things that can stimulate your mind. They'll be excellent for you to do. My fifth tip is to use your non-dominant hand. Think about opening your door or brushing, brushing your teeth. You probably do that every day with the same hand. We automatically use our dominant hand to do many activities throughout the day. And so we encourage you to use your non-dominant hand to strengthen new pathways and encourage neuroplasticity. So some examples might be brush your teeth with your other hand, or unlock your door with the other hand, broom the floor with the other hand. It may be challenging at first, but this is good because it's encouraging neuroplasticity and changes in your brain. 
My sixth tip is to try mindfulness meditation. I'm sure many of you have heard of mindful med mindfulness meditation. And so what exactly is this? Mindfulness meditation involves sitting somewhere quiet and comfortable, focusing on your breathing and trying to empty your mind. We have a constant chatter going, in our, going on in our mind, and so mindfulness meditation teaches you to calm this chatter and reduce your stress. Meditation has been shown through research to improve both physical and mental well-being by increasing your positive emotions as well as decreasing your stress. The next tip is to dance. Do Tai Chi or some sort of movement therapy. Why would this be? Doing movement encourages greater blood flow to the brain and can help sustain your neurons and sustain their health. And I encourage you all today at noon, there's a presentation, a Dance for Life presentation. I encourage you all to go, all to attend, and to think about incorporating some dance into your life. Look how much fun these people are having. Now, I know many people may not like exercise, and certainly if you have a movement disorder, there are special challenges. But we encourage you to try and make exercise a part of your life, just like eating or sleeping. And there are many things that you could try, perhaps water aerobics, something that is easier to do, low impact, or if you have problems standing or problems with your postural stability, you can always do exercise while sitting down, or you can dance while sitting down. Mm -hmm. Um, finally, you've heard a lot about dopamine and the importance of dopamine in Parkinson's disease. Exercise can help, do can help increase dopamine binding in the brain, so there are benefit many benefits to be derived from exercise. The eighth tip I have is to have a conversation with a stranger. Why, why would we recommend this? Well, having a conversation with somebody new may force you to improvise or to learn something new. This will help you form new brain connections and will also increase your social contact, which is a very important part of maintaining your emotional health. The next recommendation is to smile. I want everybody right now to smile with your big smile. Turn to the people around you and smile. Smile at each other. Smiling may be able to induce happy feelings even if you're feeling blue. And the old adage, laughter is the best medicine, may remain true. It increases blood flow, blood flow to the brain. It can improve your immune function by increasing the amount of circulating antibodies. It can reduce chronic pain and stress, and it can increase your quality of life. So I encourage you to laugh, to smile, have as much fun as you possibly can. My final recommendation, as Dr. Bowers mentioned, is to play video games. A study from North Carolina State University showed that older adults who played video games, even uh, very occasionally, were more social, were better adjusted, were less depressed. So it is a great idea to think about trying out some video games. Cognitively, it can improve your hand-eye coordination, it can improve your reaction time, and it can improve your visual acuity. Another benefit may be that you can share playing video games with your grandchildren or your children, and it's a great way to connect with them and increase your social contact. So what is the bottom line? Be active. Do anything you can to increase your activity, taking a walk, participating in dance activities. Find ways to keep yourself engaged. This may be doing puzzles, this may be traveling. Basically, do things you enjoy and live life to its fullest. Finally, you want to minimize your stress and stay as relaxed as you possibly can. Finally, I will leave you with this statement. <laughs> stay as young as you feel. To quote George Burns, you can't help getting older, but you don't have to get old. Thank you. Thank you.